We're finally ready here now this morning. Um, at this point, uh, we have a, a, a rather large number of awards to present today. Um, we have awards that some of our employees uh, have received from some outside entities. We have some awards that the agency is going to be uh, presenting not only to uh, employees, uh, but also to our Hunter Trapper education instructors, uh, our deputy game wardens, and so on. So at this point, uh, I'm going to call uh, the Bureau Director who oversees um, the particular explain a little bit about some background on the awards, and then I will ask uh, President Layton to come up and, and present the awards as well. Uh, so at this time, uh, we'll be presenting some awards from the Bureau of Wildlife Management, and I will ask uh, Director Matthew Schnupp to come up and help present. Matt? Schnupp. Sorry. Good morning, everybody. Well, Commissioner Layton's on his way down. I'd like to invite up Emily Just, who is the, uh, the Northeast Section of the Wildlife Society President. So the Northeast Section of the Wildlife Society awards uh, certificates of recognition of people who have made noteworthy contributions to knowledge about wildlife or wildlife management, furthered public understanding, or who have made available increased wildlife habitat. This year, the Wildlife Society recognized two Pennsylvania Game Commission employees. So first, for recognizing the relationship between the outbreaks of West Nile virus and the sharp declines in the rough grouse populations, following thorough research that proved that relationships, that proved that relationship, and for her outreach efforts that have resulted in fabulous rapport with Pennsylvania grouse hunters to the point of them understanding and supporting for eliminating of the late grouse season, the, the Northeast section recognized Lisa Williams of the Pennsylvania Game Commission. Congratulations. Lisa. Thanks, Thanks, Lisa. Lisa. For, tre <clears throat> for tremendous contribution to our knowledge of white nose syndrome in, in cave bats, including more than 20 publications on the disease, achieved through collaborations with academic researchers, NGOs, and government agencies with knowledge gleaned through field work that requires not only advanced technical skills, but also taking great physical risk, the section recognizes Greg Turner of the Pennsylvania Game Commission. Thanks, Greg. And finally, a recent article in the Journal of Science Advances evaluated the scientific basis of hunt management plans for 27 groups of game species across 62 U.S. state and Canada provinces. The authors reviewed a total of 667 management plans for the presence of four hallmarks, hallmark of science, which are measurable objectives, evidence, transparency, and independent review. I'm proud to say that Pennsylvania's black bear, beaver, fisher, wild turkey, and rough grouse plans all ranked within the top 10% of the plans evaluated. In addition, Pennsylvania white-tailed white -tailed deer management plans tied for to the top overall score. The Pennsylvania Game Commission recognizes Dr. Christopher Rosenberry and the Pennsylvania Game Commission deer team. Christopher. Okay, at this time, um, we have some awards for our uh, Hunter Trapper Education Instructors. I'd like to call Steve Smith, the Bureau Director for uh, Information Education, 
also Commissioners Daly and Fox to help Steve issue the awards. Good morning. As Tom mentioned, we're going to take a few minutes and recognize the significant achievement of some of our instructors who are here with us today. But before we do, I thought it'd be appropriate just to recognize our instructors in general and talk for a minute about our Hunter Ed program. Because if you think about it, Hunter Ed is really the basis of our agency's business model. It's the foundation for everything that we do. Because as we know, as an agency that doesn't receive general tax dollars, we're dependent upon license sales in order to fund our programs. And of course, we can't have uh, license sales without having individuals who've gone through Hunter Ed. So our instructors and the courses they provide, the tens of thousands of graduates that they produce each year, really are the foundation for everything that we're able to do as an agency. And ironically, as important as those contributions are to this agency from a fiscal standpoint, that's not why our instructors do it. I doubt that we have an instructor out there who gives up his weekends and his weeknights several times a year because he wants to make sure that we hit our license sale projections or that we're getting the most PR dollars. They do it because they want to make sure that our future generations of hunters, our sportsmen and sportswomen, are safe, are responsible, and that are ethical. And I think if you want to measure their effectiveness, all you need to do is look at our statistics year in and year out as they show that hunting is one of the safest uh, forms of outdoor recreation that an individual can do. And in fact, in past years and recent years, we've even been setting records for hunter safety, so it's only been getting better. So the dedication, the sacrifice that these men and women do every year and the effectiveness at their job is, is truly amazing. So uh, for all of our instructors in general, we owe them a sincere uh, debt of gratitude and our appreciation. So with that said, a few that we want to recognize here today are several different categories. We have those who've been uh, serving as Hunter Ed instructors for 50 years, those with 55 years of service. We have those receiving a Hunting Heritage Award, which is instructors who have been certified for at least three years and have gone on to recruit at least three additional instructors and we also have an award for instructor of the year. Uh, first category will be 50 years of service. Uh, when I call each individual, if you could just come forward, we'll present you with a plaque, uh, get your picture taken, and then uh, you can return to your seat. At the end of uh, this morning, we'll, we'll try to get everybody back together and do one group, big group photo. So uh, first, from the Southwest region, we have James Davis. I did also want to note that uh, it was brought to my attention that there is an accident on Route 81, so we have some who might not have been able to make it in time, and for those who aren't here, we'll be sure to get them their uh, certificate afterwards. Uh, from the South Central region, we have John Rice. Is Mr. Rice here? Yes, he is. Also from the South Central region, William Mitchell. He's the one stuck on 81, I believe. Okay. We'll get this, Mr. Mitchell. Uh, from the South Central region, William Gross. Is Mr. Gross able to make it? From the Northeast, Larry Murray. <laughs> 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 From the 
from the Southeast, John Pulaski. Also from the Southeast, Fred Fisher. And also from the Southeast, Charles Fetter. All right, the following group is those with 55 years of service, and we have William Messersmith from the North Central. It's William here. And last up with 55 years from the Northeast is Charles Fox. Oh, he got <laughs> Then we have a uh, few for the Hunting Heritage Award. Again, this is recruiting three new in instructors. From the Southwest, William Aaron. All right, we'll get that to Mr. Aaron. I don't see him. Um, John Everhart from the South Central. It's John here. There we go. Also, uh, Robert Brown from the South Central.
And finally, the award for the Instructor of the Year goes to George Gulkos. And I'll just read briefly from George his biography here. George also serves as a Deputy Wildlife Officer. He's active in recruiting new instructors and, and finding new locations to hold classes. George serves as a mentor for all instructors across the district. He ensures that information is being properly presented during all the classes. During the past year, George conducted six classes across the district and successfully passed 318 students. George has spent over 115 hours preparing for and instructing hunter ed classes in order to educate future hunters. So George, congratulations as for the Instructor of the Year. Take his questions from him. Is that a liability? <laughs> I think it's a testament to George's dedication. He showed up with a broken foot today. So that's all we have. Thank you. Certainly, as uh, the Board of Commissioners, we want to thank each and every one of the volunteer um, education instructors that we have across the state. We know that we couldn't get our word out. We couldn't get um, the youth hunters licensed. Um, and we couldn't have the safety record that we have as an agency without the hard work and dedication that, that you put in um, the, the countless hours. We thank you and we appreciate all your work. Okay, and now we're going to move on to some uh, law enforcement awards. Uh, and uh, Randy Schaup, the director of the Bureau of Wildlife Protection, will present. Uh, and I'll ask uh, President Layton to come up as well. Good morning, everyone. Um, Bureau of Wildlife Protection has several awards to give out this morning, and uh, I'd like to start that process by uh, awarding the Shikar Safari uh, International Club Award. The Shikar Safari Wildlife Officer of the Year Award is given to an officer who excels in all areas of his responsibilities. This year's winner is Warden Dirk Ramensnyder of the North Central Region. And I would like to read a few highlights from his regional director's nomination. Warden Ramensnyder has recruited and supervises the largest volunteer hunter education instructor team in the North Central Region. He also has the largest deputy force in the region and his district led the entire North Central Region in arrests and warnings. Dirk is a defensive tactics instructor, a taser instructor, first aid CPR instructor, field training officer for cadets, and a peer contact officer. It's always difficult to select a winner for these awards because we have so many excellent wardens in the field. Somehow, Dirk stood head and shoulders above the rest this year. <laughs> Congratulations, Dirk. This was a setup, by the way. <laughs> I might not even 
you make the picture? Second award today is the Conservation Law Enforcement Chiefs Association Officer of the Year Award, which is given to an officer who has made significant contributions in the area of law enforcement. This year's award winner is Warden Rick Finnegan from the Northeast Region. I'd like to summarize a few comments from his regional director. Warden Finnegan's district led the region in game law pro <coughs> prosecutions in 2017 including 18 people who were charged with unlawfully harvesting black bear through the use of bait in closed season or without hunting licenses. Rick has recruited and trained an excellent force of deputy game wardens and the spirit of camaraderie among these men is evident. Rick serves as a role model and a mentor for his fellow officers, serving as an instructor for firearms, defensive tactics, verbal skills, and emergency vehicle operations. He is also a member of the peer contact program. Warden Finnegan is unable to attend today's meeting due to previously scheduled training commitment. Accepting his award are three deputy game wardens who work with Rick in Sullivan County, Jeffrey Spaco, Michael Scott, and Michael Bedford. Come on down. We also have several Kalbfuss Barrier Awards to present today. The Kalbfuss Barrier Award is named after Joseph Kalbfuss, who was the second executive secretary of the newly formed Board of Game Commissioners in 1895, and Joseph Barrier, who was the first chief game warden. This award recognizes any game warden who utilized traditional game warden techniques or methods to detect and apprehend subjects engaged in significant violations of the Game and Wildlife Code. Our first award winners are Game Warden Mike College and Land Management Officer and Warden Rich Briggs for their efforts in investigating and apprehending persons hunting through the use of bait and unlawfully taking deer in Montour County. On down, Mike. Our next award winner is Special Investigator Larry Hergenroder for his efforts with Canine Storm to recover evidence at the scene of a fatal hunting-related shooting incident which helped identify and led to the arrest of a suspect.
And our final award today is Deputy Game Warden Charles Spuck. Deputy Spuck's sharp observation skills led to charges being filed in multiple cases related to concealed evidence, including wildlife parts, firearms, and uh, non-resident hunting with resident licenses. Charles. At this time, I'm going to turn the podium over to Travis Pugh, who is the Chief of My Enforcement Division in the Bureau of Wildlife Protection for uh, several Deputy Game Warden uh, awards. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioners, Executive Office, ladies and gentlemen. As Randy said, my name is Travis Pugh, and I am the Chief of the Game Commission's Enforcement Division which is housed in the Bureau of Wildlife Protection. Part of my responsibilities in, in that division are to serve as uh, the agency's uh, manager or oversight person of the Deputy Game Warden Program, which is what brings us here today. On April 11, 1903, legislation was passed that provided the statutory authority for the Game Commission to appoint deputy game protectors to assist full-time game protectors in protecting wildlife and providing other services to the citizens of the Commonwealth. Since then, thousands of men and women have volunteered their time to this cause, often risking their lives and have contrib contributed immeasurably to Pennsylvania's wildlife management success story. The history of wildlife management is full of stories of great dedicated service of the men and women who have served as deputy game wardens for the past 115 years. On behalf of the Board of Game Commissioners, the Executive Office, and the rest of the Pennsylvania Game Commission family, we would like to recognize those Deputy Game Wardens who have served the Commonwealth for 40 years. When I call your name, please come down here to the front. From the North Central Region, Deputy Game Warden Frank Bennett. And from the South Central Region, Deputy Burley Butch Souders. Again, I want to congratulate all the, the award, um, the people that received the awards today. We have, without a doubt, one of the best law enforcement agencies in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, our game wardens and our deputies, <clears throat> who add to that, to that fray, um, go out every day, and they do a job that um, the average person doesn't even understand really what they do. Um, there are times they, they put their lives on the line to save other people. And um, those things we don't hear about very often. But I just want to thank all of our people, all of our game wardens, our deputies, um, for the time and the service they put in. And certainly all of you who decided to step up and become game wardens here in the state of Pennsylvania. Thank you all. Okay, last but certainly not least, uh, each year the National Wild Turkey Federation uh, recognizes 
uh, a number of different employees for the work they do. Uh, so at this time, I'd like to ask uh, National Wild Turkey Federation uh, Board President uh, Heath Mace to come up uh, and present some awards as well. Okay, good morning. First, first award we have um, is the Pennsylvania chapter of the National Wild Turkey Federation 2018 Wildlife Conservation, Conservation Officer of the Year Award. Um, this is presented to the Northeast Region State Game Warden Mark Kropa of Pike County, where he has been an officer since 2007. This award recognizes an outstanding state or federal wildlife law enforcement officer for their exceptional efforts on behalf of the state's wildlife resources and especially the wild turkey. Officer Crope takes a personal interest in wildlife protection, habitat management issues, and local conservation organizations, including the National Wild Turkey Federation. His involvement at the grassroots level is a model for other officers and employees to follow and to make a difference. He employs a sound practice of citing deserving game violations at 72 in 2017 while educating those who had honest mistakes or commit minor infractions of the law. There were 190 warnings issued in excuse me, 2017. He does not tolerate serious violations and aggressively investigates them. He has also believes that a fundamental component of protecting our wildlife resource is through education. Officer Kropa has been and continues to be a tremendous asset to the hunting community, the public, his fellow state game wardens, and the Pennsylvania Game Commission. We get him up. Our next award presented by the National Wild Turkey Federation is the Joe Kurtz Wildlife Manager of the Year Award. Um, presented to Neil Idle, Southwest Assistant Regional Forester, this award recognizes individuals that work for state wildlife agencies who are technicians, area managers, turkey trappers, or work or work in similar areas. These are the unsung heroes who have made the comeback of the wild turkey a reality. These individuals are those who are not in the public eye, but put in the long hours to make our wildlife program successful. Mr. Idle has been a forester in the Southwest region since 2003, an assistant regional forester since 2010. He has been integral in the development of comprehensive management plans for the state game lands in the southwest region. His focus has been on improving degrading stands using a combination of civicultural techniques, prescribed fire, and minimizing or eradicating competitive veg vegetation and invasive plants, beneficial to wild turkeys and up other upland game birds. Mr. Idle is very professional in all phases of his duties, committed to the PGC mission and attentive to our constituents. He works effectively with con conservative groups and readily provides the public with help and information. He is an extremely hardworking, self-motivated, professional individual that has a sincere passion for all wildlife, including the wild turkey and its habitat. Thanks. 
And the last award I have today on behalf of the Pennsylvania chapter of the National Wildlife, Wild Turkey Federation is the 2018 Dr. David D. Wanless Memorial Award. This award is pre presented to Mary Jo Castellina, Pennsylvania Game Commission Wild Turkey Biologist. This award honors the individual member who has made outstanding contributions and provided service to the state chapter above and beyond the call of duty and furthering the goals and purpose of the Pennsylvania chapters as originally prescribed by Dr. David D. Lonless, first state chapter president. Ms. Casalina has been a game commission biologist for 25 years and the agency wild turkey biologist since 1999. And administering wild turkey research, monitoring, and management for Pennsylvania's second most popular game species. She interacts regularly with the National Wild Turkey Federation and the Pennsylvania National Wild Turkey Federation as the agency's technical committee representative and with the NWTF regional biologists on wild turkey related research, management, outreach, and technical assistance. The regularity with which she is consulted for input by the Pennsylvania National Wild Turkey Federation and biologists in other jurisdictions reflect both the esteem in which she is held and her willingness to share her expertise for broader application. Ms. Castellini's enthusiasm and effectiveness in coordinating with the Pennsylvania National Wild Turkey Federation have tremendous positive impact in maintaining cooperation and support for scientific wild turkey management in Pennsylvania. Mary Jo. So, biologists now, we, we've recognized a few, Craig, Chris, Lisa, Mary Jo, um, they all come here dressed up, but I think in any given day you can see them in. With the challenges that we face in Pennsylvania in the years to come, I don't envy you, your job, but we certainly appreciate everything that you do, and you know that you always have, uh, even though sometimes you don't think you do, the support of the board behind you. So thank you all. Appreciate your work. This time we're going to move into staff reports. If anyone wants to step out at this time before we start staff reports, we'll just uh extra copies of Send me a copy of that. Of <laughs> that picture. So you know they took a picture of like there's three of us out in the in the southwest with the deputies bank. It was me and um, uh, Jason Farmer. <laughs> I should have brought a, a milk crate. It's like, I was in his elbow. People were crying. They were crying. Myself included. It was hilarious. I was sweat a little bit. It was funny. I, I'll be honest with you. I thought it was hilarious.
as soon as the officer from the southwest gets settled. Let's get the staff report started. I guess since you're up there, Steve, you're on. All right. I'll try not to take it personally that everybody left when I came up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, good morning again. As you may recall, uh, this past summer there were a few well-publicized uh, incidences in which we had bald eagles dying from lead toxicity. Gonna get the door. Um, so. As a result of that, it's something that we've noticed has been on the incline in recent years, and it corresponds with the increase in the bald eagle population. Uh, other states have been dealing with this for quite some time. For us, it's a recently new phenomenon. So uh, in order to address that, uh, we figured it'd be an important issue that our, we can make our hunters aware of from an educational standpoint to see what they can do to minimize the risk of, of bald eagles uh, dying from lead toxicity. And, Commissioner Daly has, has, uh, and I have had several discussions about this, and as he pointed out to me, it was the investment that our hunters made to bring the bald eagle back. So it's only appropriate that we call on hunters and sportsmen again to try to save the population and continue what we do have, which is truly a, a great conservation success story. So the educational campaign is going to take several different facets. Uh, it's being uh, run through Lori Neely's division, Media Services. Uh, we have a brochure that I'm going to hand out that we'll be uh, making available this year to our licensed buyers. And also uh, from Lori's division, Hal Korber uh, put together a video project in conjunction with staff from Wildlife Management that really is, is the start of uh, what will be a significant educational campaign on this issue. So. The recovery of bald eagles has come a long way. From a low of two to three nests in the late 70s, we have probably over 300 nests at this point. Um, I'd say probably simply because we have so many eagles that it's a challenge to keep track of them all. It's a great problem. With that said, as the numbers increase, the chances of negative human interactions and problems associated with humans, they become magnified just as that population grows. With increasing eagle numbers, one of the challenges that's become obvious is uh, lead poisoning. Poisoning in general can be done on purpose or it can be simply a consequence of people uh, interacting with the environment around them. And lead definitely seems to, to fall in that category. Um, lead's an easy metal to use, and people have used it for all variety of, of things. Um, but because we use lead a lot, we tend to leave a lot of lead behind in the environment. And that lead's very dangerous for eagles, um, and will in fact kill them when the levels get high enough. So one of the questions we frequently get is where uh, eagles are acquiring the lead that they are ingesting through, through the poisoning. Lead toxicity does not occur when the animals are shot or have lead that is embedded in their muscle tissue. They actually need to acquire it through ingestion. Once lead hits their stomach uh, in that acidic environment, it is absorbed into their body and, and goes to different tissues. There's been a variety of research to look into what sources of lead exist that the eagles may be ingesting. Uh, and existing data suggests that they're getting it from carcasses left out in the field. This could be gut piles. Uh, left in the field. It could be carcasses of animals that were shot and not retrieved, uh, whether that's varmint hunting, small game, uh, things like that, or it could be animals that are shot and just not n never found. Uh, and the eagles then acquire the lead by ingesting those tissues of those carcasses uh, and inadvertently picking up the lead. So the way lead creates toxicity is once it's ingested and it hits that acidic stomach, uh, it is absorbed into the blood and then distributes to a variety of different tissues in the, in the body. Lead can have an effect and a negative impact on a variety of different bodily functions. 
and it, it affects a variety of different organ systems, the nervous system, the musculoskeletal system, uh, the function of the liver, as well as uh, the creation of blood products. When we see an animal that is poisoned by lead, it's got very dramatic signs. Uh, often the eagle is emaciated. Uh, it's very poor nutritional condition. Uh, it often can't move. It cannot fly or even walk. Uh, it can have seizures or neurologic signs and often may appear blind. You can frequently walk right up to an eagle uh, that is affected by lead poisoning and it may not even know you're there. The disease can take a variable amount of time depending on how much lead they ingest. Uh, but often we're looking at a duration of a couple of weeks uh, and often the birds that we see uh, have been affected long enough that they are emaciated. So if you feel their chest and their, their breast muscle, uh, they are emaciated and, and you really don't see much muscle there. So one of the things we frequently are asked are what role can hunters have in trying to reduce the lead toxicity we see specifically in our avian scavengers. There are a variety of methods that we can employ that hunters can do to, to try and reduce toxicity in our scavengers. Basically, the goal is to prevent lead from moving into those non-target species and our scavengers ingesting the lead. There are, are a whole host of, of non-lead sources of ammunition as well as fishing tackle. Uh, historically, they have been hard to, to come by and, and not all types of ammunition are available uh, and they've been quite expensive. They are non-lead sources of ammunition and tackle are much more widely available uh, in most forms of ammunition and the performance as well as cost of that ammunition is becoming uh, much, much better. So there is that where you can actually use alternate sources of ammunition then the lead is not in the carcasses or gut piles or tissues for those avian scavengers to ingest. If lead is used, there are still a variety of things we can do to prevent it from getting into avian scavengers. We can make sure we're retrieving our carcasses, uh, gut piles, or entire carcasses and getting them out of the field. If we cannot get them out of the field, such as a large gut pile or a large carcass, then we can try and do everything we can to reduce them from being ingested through an avian scavenger. That could be burying uh, those, that, those tissues, if that's feasible. If it's winter and the ground is frozen, then covering them in debris to make sure uh, as best as possible that an avian scavenger overhead uh, is not able to, to find those carcasses and go down and feed upon it. So there again are a variety of things that hunters can do to, to help us reduce lead toxicity in our scavengers. And I think we feel good and are excited to get hunters invested in the management of this disease. So that was the video. I think as you see, what we're trying to do is make our hunters aware that it's an issue and then steps they can do either consider using non-lead bullets or if they are using lead bullets, uh, make sure that they are removing the, uh, the carcass from the woods in the case of small game, but for our big game, then consider burying the, the gut pile so that our overhead, uh, the scavengers don't see it and come down and ingest the lead. So that's what we'll be pushing uh, this, this year, this upcoming hunting season to our hunters. Great. Thank you. Any questions for Steve? Yes. Steve, I uh, just want to congratulate the Bureau on finally getting this out. I think it's, it's really important information. We as hunters certainly are the ones that, you know, brought all these birds back into Pennsylvania. We've got 300 plus nests. Uh, it's a great success story. We had to keep it that way. And uh, I really applaud the efforts here. The, this is a great video. I don't know about those two hunters with the beagles, but. Uh. <laughs> They're the professional models we had there. <laughs> so, yeah. That's it. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you very much. Was that a road kill? I just. <laughs> uh, I don't believe it was. Um, it was actually in storage for four months. And Todd Holmes, our, our hunter ed coordinator, or a shooting sports coordinator, when he opened it up, he said he's glad that uh, that footage was not included because there was a little gag reflex. So <laughs> we'll show those, the blooper reel later. Anyone else? Anything else? Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Wildlife protection.
Good morning, Director Burham, staff, President Layton, commissioners and guests. I'm here today to provide an overview of the Bureau of Wildlife Protection and the important work my staff does behind the scenes every day to further the wildlife protection mission of the Game Commission. I'll provide an overview of the various divisions that comprise the Bureau of Wildlife Protection and highlights of their various duties and responsibilities. I'll also highlight some of the more significant developments in their program areas. Mike Reeder is the Chief of the Administrative Division within the Bureau of Wildlife Protection. And as you can see, Mike handles much of the Bureau's documentation, as well as many technical issues related to our prosecution database and our computer-aided dispatch. <coughs> As we move forward here, I'll give you a little bit more information on each of those uh, responsibilities. Citations and criminal complaints. Mike reviews all citations and criminal complaints written in the state by our own wardens as well as officers of other agencies who are authorized to enforce the Game and Wildlife Code, including the Pennsylvania State Police. This is a daunting task our game wardens uh, as our game wardens have initiated over 7,500 prosecutions in the fiscal year, including 55 misdemeanors and seven felonies. For many years, the unlawful taking of game and wildlife has been our leading violation, and this year is no different, comprising 15% of all convictions in the fiscal year. It is followed by other violations involving game lands abuse, baiting violations, which continue to move higher on the list, as well as safety violations related to possessing loaded firearms and vehicles and failing to wear fluorescent orange clothing required for the season. While reviewing the citations of criminal complaints, Mike refers to statutory law, agency policy, and input from regional staff to determine which cases will result in the loss of hunting and trapping privileges. Revocation is reserved for the violations that most impact our wildlife resource, and during the fiscal year, over 1,300 years of revocation were imposed upon 622 persons. Pennsylvania has been a member of the Interstate Wildlife Violator Compact since January 1, 2011. Mike is our compact administrator. In those seven years, we have individually reviewed over 37,500 violation records that have been entered into the compact database by member states. During that review process, we determined over 11,400 of those violations reviewed met our criteria, and we ratified those records, which placed those people in a revoked status in Pennsylvania. This important program keeps Pennsylvania from becoming a destination state for significant violators. On the data entry side of our participation in the compact, this chart shows the number of records we have entered into the database each year as a result of significant wildlife violations that have been committed in our state. The average number of entries per year is about 350 for a total of over 2,300 records entered. Each record represents one person whose revocation information has been shared with all other compact member states who then have the opportunity to review and apply the revocation period in their own states. On to our uh, enforcement division, Travis Pugh, who was just up here a few moments ago. Uh, Travis is the chief of the enforcement division. His duties are many and varied, and as you can see, include some very important areas of our operations. As quartermaster, Travis is responsible for purchasing and equipping our game wardens with the uniform, uh, uniform items they need to perform their daily tasks. When we are at full complement, we have 136 district game wardens. Add to that our land management officers and supervisory staff, and we have approximately 200 full-time officers. We also have approximately 350 deputy game wardens to keep equipped with a wide variety of uniform items. Travis is the primary armorer for the agency and is responsible for coordinating regional armorer training, acting as a liaison between the agency 
and the sales and support reps from the manufacturers and ensuring compliance with agency firearms policy. As part of his duties, Travis is the primary custodian of the agency's federal firearms license required to conduct agency business. Travis is responsible for administering our deputy game warden program here at the Harrisburg headquarters. And as you can see from the photo on the left, Travis does such a good job, he's even convinced at least one biologist to become a deputy game warden. On the left is Deputy Game Warden Brian Burhans being sworn in by Deputy Executive Director Rich Palmer. <laughs> On the right is Deputy Game Warden Hoppus from our southeast region who pauses with the hunter's lab while conducting an administrative inspection on goose hunters. As Chief of the, of the Enforcement Division, Travis is a ceremonial unit supervisor and coordinates the activities of the members of this unit. The Pennsylvania Game Commission Ceremonial Unit pays tribute to agency wardens killed in the line of duty and to active or retired wardens upon their death, as well as to other law enforcement officers killed in the line of duty. On the left are unit members Mike Reeder and Scott Frederick kneeling at the grave site of Game Warden David Grove, who was killed in the line, <coughs> line of duty on November 11th, 2010. On the right, are unit members Larry Hergenroder and Jim McCarthy at the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial in Washington, D.C. On to the Special Permits uh, Enforcement Division that's uh, headed by Chad Eiler. Chad's the chief of this division, and in addition to Special Permit Administration, Chad contributes to the Bureau's operations in several other program areas. Chad administers and manages the special permit system used by the agency to issue, issue thousands of special permits. He frequently interacts with our habitat management, wildlife management, and regional staff, and the public in the course of his duties. From wildlife rehabilitation, to falconry, to game bird propagation permits, and everything in between, if it's a special permit related to wildlife, it goes through Chad's division. Currently in our special permit system, there are over 25,000 active standard special permits, which are those permits found in statute or regulation. There are almost, also almost 1,000 special use permits. We're pleased with our Operation Game Thief program, and Chad played a large role in its implementation and ongoing management. Our OGT program replaced our Turn in a Poacher or TIP program, which began, began in 2008 and received approximately 500 tips per year and often had lengthy dispatch times to, to game wardens. With OGT, we receive approximately 1,250 tips each year with an average dispatch time of 21 minutes. Call volume continues to rise and improved dispatch times to the wardens are resulting in better and oftentimes bigger cases. Chad was instrumental in procuring, developing, and equipping our Operation Game Thief trailer, which has been a big hit with the public. On the left is a photo of several youngsters who are participating in a third and fourth grade Envirothon event in May of 2017. Our anti-poaching message reached 365 students, 73 Envirothon coaches from 13 New York County school districts that day. The photo on the right is the OGT trailer as it was set up at the Governor's Mansion in August of 2017 for a National Night Out event. Information and Education Supervisor Dustin Stoner reported that the trailer was well received by the public and the Governor's Office. Chad took the lead in developing the agency's Cabin Fever Sunday Information and Education Program Series held on Sundays during the late winter season. The concept is for the general public to have an opportunity to learn a skill or gain knowledge from the experiences of Pennsylvania game wardens. Several officers provided instruction in this series of programs, which included diverse topics, including cold weather, survival, winter tree identification, hiking, and canoeing. The series has been very well received and is reaching non-consumptive users who may otherwise not have shown an interest in the game commission. Chad is the BWP's self-appointed historian, and we're fortunate 
to have an officer on staff that has a deep interest in agency history. Two examples of his work are depicted here. On the left is a photo of the official Pennsylvania Historical Commission roadside marker which stands near the location of the first Ross Leffler School of Conservation near Brockway, Jefferson County. Chad worked diligently over the course of several months to provide the necessary documentation needed to have this marker approved and placed. The photo on the right depicts a ceremony where we formally recognized the in-line-of-duty death of Deputy Game Protector Charles Beecham, who was killed by gunfire in 1906. On May 11th of this year, we will be conducting another ceremony in memory of Game Protector Robert Zimmerman, who was killed in the line of duty in a vehicle accident May 13th of 1957. The officers recognized here are subsequently honored in Washington, D.C., where their names are engraved on the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial. Chad's thorough research of historical documents to have these men honored is meaningful to surviving family members and the Game Commission. Special Operations Division, headed up by Assistant Director Jason Dukoski. Uh, his duties and responsibilities uh, are, are depicted on this slide and are, are many, many and varied. He's responsible for supervising our overt investigator and canine handlers. Our canines are trained to the North American Police Work Dog Association standards in three specific disciplines, including article searches, tracking, and wildlife detection. The dogs and their handlers participate in quarterly training sessions both in-state and out-of-state with other agencies. They have been deployed for law enforcement investigations approximately 170 times in the past two years. The dogs are also a valuable public relations tool and have been used in 44 information and education programs in that same time period. Our canine handlers have developed a network of contacts with their counterparts in other states, particularly states surrounding Pennsylvania. In the fall of 2017, the Ohio Department of Natural Resources contacted our canine unit for assistance searching for evidence related to a, hunt, a fatal hunting related shooting incident which occurred just across the state line. Canine Storm and Investigator Hergen Roeder responded to the call and quickly located significant evidence related to the shooting. Ohio Investigator Brian Kaiser, who at one time was a deputy game warden in Pennsylvania, was able to use this evidence to piece together the case. On a photo on the right, Ohio Supervisor Jared Roof and Investigator Brian Kaiser present Canine Storm and Investigator Hergen Roeder with an award for their assistance in the case. The overt uh, investigator positions provide depth to our law enforcement investigations that is difficult to achieve at the district game warden level. Since these three investigators are not responsible for the everyday duties of a district, they have more time to focus on areas that may have been overlooked in the past. One example is the non-resident license case that is currently underway. Investigator Dave Allen spent significant time reviewing records and discovered many non-resident hunters who were purchasing resident hunting licenses and cost savings. This investigation is focusing on individuals who have exhibited a pattern of behavior, a behavior indicative of fraudulent activity related to license purchases. We suspect it will be helpful in reducing fraudulent license purchases by these individuals in the future. Jason also supervises our Covert Special Investigations Unit. Covert Special Investigations Unit focuses on the unlawful commercialization of wildlife. Commercialization of wildlife cases are quite common, and social media and websites designed for commerce have increased the need for investigations in the area of commercialization. A recent case that has been completed through the state court system was related to the buying and selling of wildlife parts which was occurring at Native American social gatherings known as powwows. Powwows are events where Native American people gather to honor their cultures. It is common for those in the Native American culture to use wildlife and wildlife parts 
as part of their ceremonial dance and costumes and, and qualified individuals are generally permitted to possess and use these parts under the authority of federal law. Commercialization, however, is never permitted under state or federal law. In this case, these events were attracting people who viewed wildlife as a source of income and were willing to commit violations of the law related to the unlawful buying and selling of game or wildlife, including bald eagles, osprey, waterfowl, and many other species. The state charges alone in this case resulted in $80,000 in fines and a total of 120 years of hunting license revocation for the state defendants. Jason supervises our woodland tracking team, which has de deployed over 15 times in the past year for incidents ranging from lost hunters, evidence recovery and hunting related shooting incidents and fugitive apprehension. Specific incidents include warden and tracking team member Kevin Anderson and DCNR Ranger Steve Schaefer using tracking skills to locate and investigate a marijuana grow on state property. Once the site was located, surveillance cameras were used to capture images of the suspects, which ultimately led to their identification and arrest. In another example, tracking team members used tracking skills and knowledge of State Game Lands 33 to locate two lost hunters, a grandfather and his granddaughter. The hunters became separated from their hunting party and were missing for eight hours. The search ended at 3.30 a.m when they were found three miles from the nearest road. The grandfather said he was never so happy to see a game warden in his life. <laughs> now our communications division um, has, has two individuals in it, John Lane and Mike Watkins. Uh, the agency's radio communication system is undergoing a major upgrade. John Lane has been our radio expert for many years and has done an excellent job maintaining our aging low-band radio system. The system has been adequate for agency operations for many decades, but has become antiquated and costly to maintain. The consoles and components of the low-band system are no longer supported by the manufacturers, and it is becoming increasingly difficult to find repair and replacement parts. In short, we've squeezed the life out of our existing radio system, and it has nothing left to give. The new radio system known as P25 has been deployed in the Northwest region and is ongoing in the Southwest region as we speak. The sequence of deployment has been determined by the Pennsylvania State Police and will be implemented over five years in a counterclockwise direction, ending in the Game Commission's North Central region. Mike Watkins is the primary PGC employee responsible for implementing the new P25 radio program for the agency. Feedback from the regions has been very positive and it appears this radio project will result in radio communications that are unprecedented for our agency, which bodes well for officer safety and greater efficiency of operations. And I promise you, I'm almost done. I know it's been a lengthy, <laughs> it's been a lengthy presentation. Legal is Jason Raup and Jason is an important part of the Game Commission's legal team and works directly with the Bureau of Wildlife Protection and the regions. As you can imagine, Jason has many duties related to his position in our legal department. His work in the Bureau is invaluable and I'm glad to have him as part of my team. The oft-repeated mission statement of the agency is to manage Pennsylvania's wild birds, wild mammals, and their habitats for current and future generations. Law enforcement has played an important, important role in the history of this agency and the need for wildlife law enforcement is the very reason that this and many other wildlife agencies were created over 100 years ago. The goal of the Bureau of Wildlife Protection is to supply the necessary equipment, training, and support for our game wardens so they can continue to provide a high level of law enforcement and service that our citizens and wildlife resources deserve. While I highlighted the contributions of my division chiefs, I would be remiss if I failed to mention and thank our outstanding clerical staff who keep the day-to-day -day functions of the Bureau running. We couldn't do it without them. That ends my presentation. I'll be glad to take any questions. Anybody have any questions?
Comments? Thank you, Randy. Oh. You're off the hook. For now. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Rosenberry. Good morning. Good morning. Today I'll provide a brief overview of the status of deer and elk populations as well as recommendations for uh, antlerless deer and elk license uh, allocations. <clears throat> Much of our time this winter, field season was spent capturing adult female elk to collect blood samples for pregnancy testing. As a result, we're still working to complete the 2018 minimum count. To date, we've counted 774 elk and we have observed 17 of our 37 collared animals along our survey routes. Uh, as we get visuals on the remaining collared elk uh, this week and into next, as we move off of the routes and look for those individual animals, uh, we expect the total certainly is going to increase uh, as we count those animals as well as the animals that are associated with them. Uh, so we expect the minimum count number to be higher this year than where it is right now. Uh, but given our minimum count results to date, our elk population is doing well and we are recommending an additional hunt zone for this fall's hunting seasons. For the 2018 elk hunting season, we're adding hunt zone 14 to the northeast. Over the last few years, dozens of elk have been located in this zone and the number continue to increase. As a result, we're recommending additional hunting opportunity for this zone. And hunters should find plenty of area to hunt as this zone is 86% public land. The elk license recommendations for all zones are noted in the table. We're looking at a total of 26 antler and 99 antlerless tags this year. Zone one, the large green zone on the west and the southern uh, portions there of the hunt zones, uh, that zone does not get a specific allocation, but it is open to all hunters with an elk license. Uh, in zone seven, uh, barely can see it there in the middle, a tiny little zone. Uh, it covers a few square miles around the Elk Country Visitor Center and our Game Commission viewing areas, and there are no tags allocated to that zone. We're also looking at some minor boundary changes around Zone 7 to reduce confusion and create more, a more clearly defined boundary for hunters and guides in that area. This year's license recommendations by hunt zone are similar to last year's numbers. And Zone 5, the elk population there appears to have been reduced, so the allocation there is also uh, less than what it had been last year. And in zone eight, some of those tags were allocated to zone two and other zones following some of that boundary changing around zone seven, which zone eight is in that vicinity. Our recommendations for antlerless deer locations follow this defined process. Now, this process incorporates the goals of the Game Commission's deer plan in a defined manner that is supported by data. Biological data are collected by Game Commission staff from most bureaus in all regions. Forest data are collected by the U.S. Forest Service and analyzed by Bureau of Wildlife Habitat Management personnel. So now I'll go through the uh, antlers allocation and I and note some of the important data that we've used in our recommendations for this year. Deer populations across Pennsylvania are sustainable at current harvest levels, as indicated by stable or increasing deer populations uh, throughout the state. When this slide, dark green, represents units that have increasing deer populations, the light green represents populations with stable, uh, units with stable populations. This year we did uh, detect declining fawn to doe ratios in four units, uh, 2D, 2E, 2F, and 3B. Uh, but their overall populations in those units are stable. Uh, some of them are even tr starting to trend up, uh, although not significant uh, to be noted here on this slide. So as a result, we're not making any management recommendations uh, to address those fawn to doe ratios. Those populations, despite what we've measured, uh, seem to be doing fine. 
Forest regeneration is fair or good across Pennsylvania. Uh, there in the South Central, uh, unfortunately for 2C and 4A, uh, the presence of chronic wasting disease in those units uh, overrides any benefits of having good regeneration in terms of antlers allocation recommendations. Uh, for units 2F, 3B, and 3D, Regeneration is good, but most people consider the deer population about right or too high in those units, so we're recommending stable populations in those three units. And then, 2G, the deer impact, as measured by the Forest Service, is considered high, and for this reason, we're recommending a higher antlers allocation in 2G for this upcoming year. CWD continues to spread across Pennsylvania. On this slide, DMAs 2, 3, and 4 are outlined in red. The blue dots represent CWD-infected free-ranging deer that were detected prior to uh, 2017. The green dots represent CWD-infected deer detected in 2017, and we are still uh, at this time waiting for uh, results from additional 2017 samples. So there's probably going to be more green dots on that map uh, before long. So clearly 2017 represented an increase in the number of infected deer and the area affected by CWD. And that has influenced our recommendations in a number of units. In DMA2, the core of our CWD infection, the percent of samples that is testing positive, as indicated by the red markers in the red dashed line, increases every year. And it follows that the area affected by CWD, indicated by the blue markers and, dash, and the blue dashed line, also is increasing. And although the percent of our sample that is infected right now is less than 3%, we are very concerned with the impact of CWD on deer and deer hunting in this area for two reasons. First, the small increases we're observing at the moment are similar to the observations in West Virginia and Wisconsin in the first few years of their outbreaks. Unfortunately, that increase in both of those states continued and began to increase rapidly. And the dashed line is what was observed in general for the general pattern in West Virginia. The solid line is the general pattern in Wisconsin. According to preliminary results from our most recent deer hunter survey here in Pennsylvania, if CWD infections reach the level observed in West Virginia and Wisconsin, about a third of our Pennsylvania deer hunters say their interest in deer hunting will decline. So obviously this is a significant concern for the future of deer and CWD management efforts. So that's our first concern with the fact that our prevalence in our samples uh, continues to increase each year. Second, recent research from Wyoming documented reduced survival for CWD infected deer. In general, deer infected with chronic wasting disease experience survival rates of about half of those that were not infected with CWD. So using a, just a simple model of, of a Pennsylvania deer population that, we, that starts with hunter or harvest and success rates that we've observed in our field studies, we can uh, set a population to be stable over the next 25 years. If we change those survival rates to half, similar to the observations from the Wyoming study, for only 3% of the white-tailed deer, we can see what could happen to our deer population. So over a 25-year period, that deer population potentially declines by about a third. So although this, pop, this model is a very simplistic, it does highlight another area of concern as it relates to CWD and our management efforts to try and control it. As a result of these concerns, antlers allocation recommendations have been affected in a number of units. First, in wildlife management unit 2D and 2E, we are recommending an increase in the antlers allocations. These WMUs have high deer populations where hunters harvest the most bucks per area of any place in the state. And the level at which they're harvesting bucks per area is almost double what they're harvesting in West Virginia and Wisconsin CWD areas. Given what has happened to CWD in those two states with lower deer numbers, we are concerned about the effect of CWD and what could happen in these units with the deer populations that they have. Second, in Wildlife Management Unit 2C, we are recommending a higher allocation because this deer population is increasing. And the recommendation is intended to stop that population increase. 
And finally, in 4A, we are recommending an increased antlers allocation to increase deer hunting opportunities. To date, efforts to increase antlers hunting through allocations in DMA and DMAP permits have not stopped the increase in CWD. As a result, we're recommending more effort to affect deer populations in this area. And when it comes to CWD, we are limited in our ability to predict the outcome of management actions. However, for these units, we can look to other states and our own experiences to see that we need to do more. Our antlers allocation recommendations are one part of our attempt to do more to address the threat of CWD to deer and deer hunting in Pennsylvania. And finally, this slide shows a summary table of the deer population trends, the deer plan objective, and the recommended allocation to achieve the deer plan objective. And with that, I'd be glad to answer any questions you may have. Chris, on your map, you showed some dots where positive deer were found outside of the disease management areas? Yes. Are those, are we pending increase there, in the size of the management areas? Uh, for... Like that one up in 2C, is that the portage deer? Yes. Okay. That, that one's portage. That one's in DMA2 already. Where... I, I suspect... Oh, okay, okay. That's not the whole DMA. No. Here, that's the 11 back. township. Yeah, do I have one? I'm not sure I have this. Okay, that's okay. I was just, there we go. Okay. Yeah, so in DMA3, okay. you have uh, one green dot up there in the northwest corner, right on close to the boundary, and then you have uh, one right there above the 2E. Mm -hmm. uh, those are new detections, and they will result in an expansion of DMA3. That one in the middle, is that the road kill that was? The one in the middle. That's it a was, deer farm. That is the one where, those are, these are all free ranging. There's no captives okay. in here. Okay. The one, the first green one is the uh, hunter killed deer from this hunting season. The one right above it is the one from last summer. Okay. Uh, the clinical suspect that our officers uh, shot and tested and turned okay. out to be positive. So DMA3, there will be an expansion of DMA3. Uh, I'm assuming there will be an expansion of DMA3. Hasn't been official yet as far as I know. Uh, DMA2 right now, uh, none of those uh, new green dots uh, suggest an expansion, but like I said, we're still waiting on some results uh, that most likely there may be some expansion there. And in DMA4, that's just a captive facility okay. as f at the moment. Chris, is that, um, is that DMA3, is that a continuation of the ridge from DMA2? Is that what we suspect is going on there? I, I'm not, I don't know that it is. I mean, DMA3 started with two captive facilities. Correct. Yeah. Uh, and even there, there's, you know, that one to the south, possibly, uh, the one to the south part of the, the border, it's not unreasonable to think that a individual deer could have traveled that far from DMA2. I mean, we have seen individual deer do it. Highly unlikely that an animal traveled that far, but it, we can't say it wasn't possible. Um, but, you know, there, CWD is difficult enough, and, and what you're seeing with some of these is, it just isn't fitting into a nice story in terms of what's happened. Uh, the one from last summer, you know, with the, the targeted removals this winter, uh, we didn't find another positive. That was a clinical suspect animal that, by all accounts, should have had CWD for a period of time. It was an adult animal, most likely should have lived in that area and been spreading the prions, and yet a significant effort of targeted removal there, and, and we found no additional positives. And it was a pretty large sample taken. It was a very large sample. So I, it, it's hard to tell, and that's, that's the problem. And I think from our standpoint on the, in the deer and elk section, uh, certainly we have some ideas on how things have happened, but at the end of the day, we can only deal with what we have, and this is what we have, so. So some of the DNA work that we're doing, will, will that answer those questions? Unfortunately, my experience with the DNA so far with white-tailed deer is it's not TV, law and order type show. It, it, it's not nearly as clear cut. They don't spring up and say, oh, that's, a cap, that's captive origin or that's wild origin. Uh, and with some of that dispersal, it's difficult. You know, we can't rule out a fact that a deer might have traveled 30 or 40 miles because we have documented bucks traveling that far. Right. Or doe out in 2D traveling 100 and some miles uh, at one point. She ended up 15 miles from where she started, but she traveled 100 and some miles. So we're never gonna have that black and white moment. Don't think so. Now this so is what we had to deal with. Right. So we However, can't 
So we can't rule out uh, an escaped deer or a deer that was let go from a, from a game farm no. that had an issue? I, I don't think we can rule that out. We can't rule out the fact that one deer might have traveled a long distance. Um, but certainly, they're both plausible. Yes. Chris, one of the things that we always looked at is forest regeneration and setting these allocations. But hearing from farmers again today and you know the ones you went to go see over in 2D, in some of these wildlife management units, I mean, the, the percentage of agriculture is pretty high. Right. And you've got to think that if, if the deer are able to feed on all these agricultural fields, they're not causing damage in the forest because they're in the ag areas. Um, is there any way we can begin to incorporate, at least in the WMUs that have a lot of agriculture, agricultural impact as, a, as, a, as another means of setting our allocation? Yes. We've looked at that in the past. Uh, and there, I'm, I'm sure there is a way we can do it, and we could come up with something. What we've often looked at in the past is when it comes to the forest regeneration measure, one of the more critical periods is the winter time. And a lot of crop fields at that point are not providing a lot of food resources. So those deer are dependent on the natural vegetation. Uh, so it should appear, you know, the forest measure would provide us meaningful data uh, even in ag areas uh, because of the the fact that a lot of those ag areas aren't supporting deer necessarily during the winter time. The other side of it is when you get into ag damage, the forest measures are specific data based on measures and objectives in following forest over time and what can regenerate a forest. Uh, when it comes to ag damage, we've tended to view that more as a social type of measure. Uh, so we've incorporated them in when we did the CAC process. We had agriculture representatives on the CAC, uh, on their advisory committees. Uh, they've been a part of the residents in terms of getting surveyed when we did the survey back in 2011. Uh, because individual farmers, you know, the same number of deer causing the same damage for one can be a problem, for another it's not. So I think when you start to get into those more of a value judgment, uh, it's, in our view, up to this point, it's been best to leave that to survey type work to get those you know, responses from the public uh, based on their individual values rather than trying to set some hard criteria. With forest, you can do that because of the research. You have to have at least this many seedlings if you want to have a future forest. With ag, it's a lot more of the values aspect to it, uh, and that has been the hesitation over the years to try and come up with some number or some hard criteria for ag damage. But we could, I mean, you know, we look at, we have red tag documentation, but again, not every person having damage, you know, engages in red tag. You could measure it as a relative. 2D, for example, is a unit that has, you know, in recent years had the most red tag. Well, that's relative, but it's, uh, it's also a bigger unit. So it's, it's not as clean cut on the social Some side. Some of the ag issues too. I mean, you know, they showed, just like this Armstrong County, they showed $7 million in damage. Right. But we don't know how much of that is deer damage, how much of that is weather related, how much of that is, yeah. you know, I mean, and I'm not doubting that they have right. deer damage. Right. Um, but certainly not all their damage yeah. is deer damage. Yeah. No, it, the fact that there's not a hard cutoff or something specific in there is not uh, a reflection of that it's not important. Uh, anybody that's grown a garden or anything like that, you can begin to empathize with farmers and what they're dealing with because they're doing more than just trying to grow a garden. It's a livelihood. Uh, but it, it's just very difficult to come up with a, a hard cutoff for, for ag or a hard objective. You know, I, I think we all recognize um, the issues that the farmers are having. I think we give them programs uh, with which to control their own individual issues. And I think it's better done that way than a prophylactic approach of adding uh, more tags. Uh, should we start to include that sect of information in the, uh, in the process, which would just raise the, the overall tags over the unit, doesn't mean that those people will go to where the problem is. I think farmers need to use the programs that we give them. The DMAP tag program is, is meant for them. Uh, and I think once they get involved in it, and we've seen it in a lot of the units that I have, that that people are starting to get involved, get involved in the DMAT uh, program, and uh, I believe it's working out for them. So. Any other questions? Anything else?
That's it. Okay. Thanks. Dang, Bernie, we get the afternoon off. <laughs> Is that it? That's it. We're done for the day. So tomorrow morning, what? We're starting at 8, 8.30. Tomorrow's voting meeting starts at 8.30.